This is the Tabernacle Podcast with John Vermilia and me, Britton Bishop. What's up, John? I have the fever. The fever. Fever. World Cup fever. Okay. The greatest, or the, yeah, the greatest sporting spectacle on the planet. Have you ever been to one? Yes. Dang, where at? Yes. First uh, World Cup of soccer I ever attended, I was 20 years old in Italy. Oh. Yeah. Dang. I was actually there on a missions trip. And as part of the missions trip, <laughs> we got th- uh, t- tickets to three different games. It uh, was uh, awesome. That's very yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. Hope and I watched it yesterday. The Or not yesterday. I guess it was, yeah, it was yesterday. People know these podcasts come out a week later. Um, we watched it on uh, the USA versus Wales. Oh, that was epic. And uh, we're watching the game. and She's like, ooh, and and on. And, oh, that was sweet. And, like, all this stuff. And I'm just... You're like, wait, what happened? What? And Adam and I are just texting <laughs> each other in a group message with you and Jonesy, but you guys aren't texting back. And Adam is like, Jonesy doesn't like to talk crap during soccer games. Oh, so Jonesy, Ryan Jones, <laughs> the legend, uh, my bro, my best bro, he's from Wales. Uh, we coached together at Buckley High School. Uh, so we arranged, he was in my living room, surrounded by my family, <laughs> the lone Welshman uh, with, uh, and the language was flying. <laughs> Not how for fired, me. Not for me. Up yeah, was yeah. But PK he was. He in. was just. Oh, he was so excited. He goes, "Come on, man! Come <laughs> on!" You know. But here's the other crazy thing, because he grew up going to games. Uh-huh. We're both Manchester United fans too, and so uh, and here it is, my country, his country, going head to head, and uh, there was great spirit in the room. But when he grew up going to games, he always stood. You you had to stand right. at the game. You don't sit. Right. It, what what are we some sort of what what, what is this baseball? No offense right. to baseball, but dude, you can't. I'm with you. I mean, four hours yeah. sometimes. You're you're not going to stand the whole time. Nope. You're going to sit, stand, sit, stand, depending on the inning and the situation. Soccer, you stand. I mean, you stand yep. in his living room every game I ever watch with him. He stands. And then the rest of us are sitting, and so then he'll be like, oh, right, maybe I should have a seat. And then he's like, ah, forget this. And he's standing. You know, so he's parked in the middle of my living room with every kick. I'm playing every kick of the game. And so I don't know what was more entertaining uh, the sounds game. sounds amazing. But I got the fever. I, yes. I'm, I'm watching all the games. I know. You know? I'm, I got a new sports fever as well. Last week I got to go to the big house, and it was a, one of those stand the whole time type experiences, but it's it was nuts. So the Oklahoma boy... Got to go to Ann Arbor. Yes. Michigan Sing, University football. Playing playing who? Playing? Illinois. Illinois. I'm going to say this. Okies, I'm sorry. Single-handedly the greatest sporting experience of my whole entire life. Wow. And Being I was at house. OU Notre Dame when Manti Teo picked off the ball to close the game to, for BCS stuff. I've been in some big ones. Illinois, Michigan, last second field goal to win it. The most inebriated individual in Ann Arbor, Michigan, sitting next to me. I don't know who this man was. He was not a part of my crew, but he was in it to win it with the fireball. Wow. Like he was, it was ridiculous. Wow. He I don't, was gone. He snuck him in and he's been, I was like, so how long have you been kind of season ticket holder since 77? And wow. Like, oh, and he was man. fireballed up. Oh, he like headbutted me at one point in the arm. <laughs> it was insane. But it was, I mean, we're packed in. It's like 11 degrees uh, and it was the greatest. Yeah. It was insane. Loud, uh, something about 100,000 people, Illinois, their first drive, wide receivers wide open, they throw him the ball, he drops it, it's fourth down, punt teams run on the field, fire up the Michigan band, and at the very end it's like, da 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 and then the whole crowd in unison yells, you suck. <laughs> it's like, I'm in. You're I will in. root for you forever. <laughs> if this is how we talk so to people. So that is your big team, your Big Ten team. 100%. You're, you're I'm declaring. in. declaring. I'm selling yeah. out. Yeah. Big Sar- Ten Sorry, football. Sparties. Michigan, yeah. it's a family thing. Both my in-laws graduated from the U of M. They're loyal. They buy yeah. me Michigan stuff for Christmas. Nice. Hope loves Michigan. I'm so glad you got to do that. Yeah, it was awesome. I've uh, only been to a sporting event in the big house once, and this will disappoint oh. <laughs> most Northern Michiganders. It was an exhibition game, Manchester United versus Liverpool. <laughs> so t- it was, it was, I bet it was nuts. It was nuts. I was going to say. Half of... The I almost said congregation. <laughs> Half of the stadium didn't. What English was not their first language. Yes. So there were so many immigrants coming oh. from Chicago, Detroit, just all over Michigan, Indiana, Ohio. You name it, they were there. Did you go to that with Jonesy. Yes. Oh. And um, who won? And my kids. Yeah. Um, Liverpool. Oh. Unfortunately, it was exhibition. It didn't matter. Yeah, it didn't matter. It, it didn't matter. This one mattered. And last second field goal. It was That's insane. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Drove in. A- As of this recording, they're still perfect. 
Yes, as yeah. of this recording. But I said it on Sunday in Manistee. That's going to be tough. Yeah. Especially after this what, weekend's after the what big I one. just watched. Yeah. It's going to be tough. Well, let's, here's to it. But you know what's going to be better is what we're talking about today. 100%. 100%. What are we talking about because today, Britain? Because at the end of the day, we have to remember in the words of the infamous, who will be on here soon? Tab family, you're about to meet a legend. He said, I'm not even going to say his name. One day I asked this individual, why do I care? Why do I care about these sports teams? And he looked at me in the most sobering tone. Because you think it matters. Because you think it matters. <laughs> Dude, and, doesn't uh, that just kind of, it, it, it oh, gives yeah. you the reels, but you also kind of crawl down yes. from your excitement level like, just a little ah. bit. You're like perspective, perspective, yes. And that perspective. was the day where I came in the back door. You're like, what's wrong? Nothing. And then it's like, oh, you lost. Oh, okay. That oh, makes sense. because so. you think it matters. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. But today we're going to jump into uh, part two. This is something we started with um, Adam Sharp, who is supposed to be here, but he's not. So make sure to send him some hate mail. Because apparently lost his voice. <laughs> lost his you voice. You lose your voice. You're 30 something years old. Grow up. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> oh, wow. No, I'm just kidding. Zingers. For I'm Adam. convinced he it didn't lose his voice. He's just talking quietly to get out of this. But, Probably. Uh, lost his voice. So he's not joining us. But we're going to jump back into uh, First John and uh, continue in our uh, fight clubbing of some verses from First John. So we'll be in verse five to recap. Uh, we just did the first four verses in about an hour and a half or something like that. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't quick. <laughs> no, and, but one thing I think the more I've talked to people that lead fight clubs or tab women groups and stuff is, is that's not abnormal just because we're pastors. And so I would encourage you, if you lead a fight club or you lead a tab women's group, slow down. There's a lot in there. Yeah. Take time, chase the bunny trails, have conversations. Don't let it just be black and white. Let's get to the point because I think that sometimes whenever – that, that whole process of just smoking through it to say we did it, that's the stuff that burns people out. So I would say slow down, take your time. Four verses sometimes is plenty. And uh, and so, yeah, that would be my encouragement. But in those four verses, what do we talk about? Are you talking about in the first four? Yep. It's yeah. a little recap. So, yeah, so that, that whole passage with these epic verses, the way John always um, writes, is that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, we've looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And so he's just telling these people, we've seen Jesus, we talked to him, we hung with him, we camped with him, we walked around a lake with him for three years. This is what we're passing on to you. And the real life in Christ, it was made manifest in him. We've seen it, we testify to it. And that that we saw and we testified to, we're going to proclaim to you that and it ends that our so or so so that you can have fellowship with him, fellowship with us, and fellowship with the Father through Christ His Son. Do that, your joy, our joy, everyone's joy will be complete. Yeah. So just in his declaration, there's so many layers, there's so much theology, um, which alludes to what you were talking to, and which what we always repeat: there's no wasted words yep. in Scripture. But that was just the intro. That took us an hour and a half. Right. The second part of chapter one, I, I think, is where, what, what you're going to read for us yeah. today. This is uh, chapter one, verse five. I'm reading from the CSB. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light and there's absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. We confess our sins. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Yeah, so there's this beautiful concept that uh, uh, just... Anyone who's ever read the Gospels, we can remember how Jesus declared that I am the light of the world. Mm -hmm. And so um, when when he says God is light, uh, there's always some people that want to be literalists where it's obvious that we are being uh, or that it's not literal. You know, Jesus also said, I am the door. Well, Jesus wasn't a wooden panel with a handle (laughs) and some hinges. But when it says that God is light, it's, it's speaking to his moral purity his perfect knowledge, uh, his perfection, his moral excellence, um, and his utter transcendence. Mm. That um, the light that allows us to see truth, to see the way, 
the light that exposes us for who we are, all that is in God. And that in Christ, God in flesh, uh, that's in Jesus Christ as well. Yeah. And so when he came into the world, boom, he, he, he brought light. And, yeah. and um, you know, I'm, I'm sure we've both said this before uh, and heard this and been taught this. Light always chases out darkness. Yep. You can never have enough dark that will overcome light. Yes. Like dark can't, you know, I, in fact, I remember this back in the day, you know, trying to preach that. I just thought of this mm-hmm. just now, uh, preaching this um, to students mm-hmm. um, in what we call foundry now. It was firehouse at the yep. original. And uh, we figured out a way in the old firehouse here in Buckley to black out everything in the, uh, you know, the whole place. And mm-hmm. I, and I, and I did my best cause we were packed. There was 75 kids yeah. and I was like, everybody be perfectly still want to show you something. And they were, you know, they thought it was a magic trick. Right. And so we're sitting in complete darkness. Even the exit sign blacked out as dark as we could make it. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. There's no windows in there at right. the time. Then I lit a match. And then as eyes grew accustomed to it, you saw just that little light start to chase away darkness. Mm. And so that's what I always think of of when I think about that God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. The light of who he is chases darkness. Yeah. And that's why I love the the emphasis that John um, puts in the CSB translation, uh, the way they say is there's absolutely no darkness. That word absolutely, I think, is a good... um, Reminder, and it's a good um, assurance that this is the Christ, this is the the God that we serve, is that there is no darkness. And that's, I don't know, it's promising. It, it reminds me, too, um, of in John uh, chapter 8, verse 12. That's a good thing for the podcast to have, is the sound of pages yes. turn. Yeah. John 8, verse 12. Yes. Go for it, man. And it starts, the, the section is called The Light of the World. And Jesus spoke to them again, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. And so I, I think that that is just a cool promise as well to those of us that are trying to follow um, Jesus. He talks about this as well in the Sermon on the Mount when he's um, speaking to the, the crowds that are around him. But just this promise that not only is God light, but that whenever we're in him, we also begin to be light as well. And that's our call is to be light to the world. And so I think that as, as we're looking at that and some of those things that you listed out of, what does it mean to actually be light in a dark place? What does it mean to go and be a light of Christ? I, um, in the Sermon on the Mount, turn there and find it. But uh, it talks about how a city built on a hill, um, it's you, a lamp. You don't light it and put something over it to cover it up. And so I think... For us as believers, what does that truly mean to be light? Like, what does that mean? And that would be right. a question. I don't know. I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. So in that process of that's what it says, what does it mean to be light as a follower of Jesus? Well, I think in the uh, very next verse, he starts to flesh it out. Yeah. And so we look right in the context. This is where we're going. So when we go verse by verse, it's like, okay, so what is light? Yep. Well, six says, we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. Mm. Now, I remember when I first read this, and I'm still in my struggle with, you know, being a man Mm. in this world, uh, saying no to sin, saying yes to God. I took this in absolutist terms, whereas, oh, if there's any dark in me, um, then there's a problem. Well, uh, I I have right here on my laptop, uh, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, the message, open. And that first verse, he says, this in essence is the message we have heard from Christ and are passing on to you. God is light, pure light. There's not a trace of darkness in him. And as I'm thinking about that, that goes back to what you were saying. There are traces of darkness in me Mm -hmm. because I'm not God. Right. But God is chasing out the darkness in me. And obviously when we talk about darkness, it's our selfishness, it's our pride, it's our ego, it's our, honestly, our mortality mm-hmm. and the fact our our humanity you know um you know that phrase that that we've stolen from Heidi Burgess uh Pastor Tim's wife that you know God God knows that we're made from dirt right you know I, I think the way she puts it is God has low expectations of dirt 
found right. a verse for that the other oh, day. Oh, did you found a verse Sorry. for that? I'm going to chase but, this real quick while you talk but, about it. But, but when it says there's not a trace of darkness in him, the very next verse in Peterson's paraphrase says, if we claim that we experience a shared life with him, that's fellowship, and continue to stumble around in the dark, we're obviously rot- lying through our teeth. We're not living what we claim. Mm-hmm. And so that doesn't mean I'm not going to stumble. But if I'm in complete darkness and I'm giving lip service to God, but there's times when I'm in the darkness and I see that little pinprick of light and I can make my way in that direction. Yeah. To me, that's walking towards the light and the more, or, or sorry, not the more, the closer I get to the light, sooner or later, I'm going to be walking in that light mm. instead of the darkness that I find myself in. Yeah. Psalm 103 uh, talks about the forgiving God. And uh, this actually plays exactly to what we're talking about in verse 11. Uh, it starts, it says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As far as, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. In verse 14, for he knows what we are made of, remembering that we are dust. Remembering that we are dust. Yeah, and I think that that just speaks to it, is that it's it's not a perfectionist gospel. It's a gospel of I think at times, and this is, I mean this in a different way than I think maybe it'll sound, but it's the way I can think of to say it. This is an effort, right? I'm seeking and striving to live in light. I'm seeking and striving to actively be canceling out that darkness by allowing the truth and the wisdom and the love of Christ to permeate all those spaces in my life, right? Because that pride or um, whatever it might be that comes to, to surface in those moments where that veil falls away and that darkness is again revealed, whatever that might be, at the end of the day, that's just a long, our whole discipleship process is just slowly allowing the truth, the love, and the wisdom of God to permeate our innermost parts. And that's why I love uh, Foster um, Christie, the way he says, he's like, even the secret places. Even in the secret places. And those, I think all of us have those places in our heart, in our life, maybe it's in your thought life, maybe it's whatever it might be, but there are secret places in your life that there's still darkness, that haven't ex- been exposed to light for for, um, for whatever it might be. Maybe it's fear, what will people think? Maybe it's pride, maybe it's trauma. I don't know what it is, but I think that that, that whole picture of what does it look like to allow that, that light to continue to, um, to dig and get in deeper to those places and allowing the truth, the love, and the wisdom of God to come into that, I think is cool. So this is where a really cool study Bible helps us out, mm-hmm. just gives us all kinds of yep. ideas. And so we started in First John. Yep. You found that verse uh, where it says in Psalm 103, for he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust, is what it says in the ESV. So my note on verse 14 says mm-hmm. that uh, the Lord remembers the finiteness of the human perspective because dust is not eternal mm. or omniscient. And it says, and he is patient with his people. And so what I'm not trying to do, I don't think what we're trying to do is saying, walking in the light, uh, that doesn't really matter. We're not saying that. We're walking towards the light. We're walking in the light. And the light isn't just perfection and his Mm -hmm. holiness and our action. The light is also his truth Mm -hmm. that my way, God is saying, is better than your way. Yes. That my commands are for your good. They're not just to appease God. You know, when we look at the Ten Commandments, uh, just, you know, that's the simplest one to go back to. But not stealing is good for me. Yeah. Not lying to people is good for me. Not coveting is good. You know what? Not hating people or murdering people, Mm. which comes from the thou shalt not kill, that's good for me. Yeah. Or this envy or this, you know, not worshiping other gods, that's walking in the light. And so back, back to 1 John. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. And that last phrase in the ESV says, and do not practice the truth. Yep. So we were talking about before the podcast, you know, you want to get in an argument with churches, you start talking about discipleship. Right. Well, yeah, there's a lot of programs you can go through. Mm-hmm. You can learn, uh, you know, some, you know I, I know of one from way back in the day when I was uh, in college, they wanted to teach you the whole Bible using hand motions, <laughs> you know, and Sorry, it was... It's a great way to remember things. Yeah. yeah that's, but that's not the only way. Right. The bottom line, when you boil all these things down, you know, whether you use in a workbook or, you know, I know of a church out in Idaho that to be a member of their church, you have to have gone through these three workbooks 
and you have to um, be ready to take other people through these three workbooks. Mm-hmm. That's cool. I mean, I'm sure some well-meaning people put that program of discipleship right. together, but it really starts feeling and sounding like a cult. Yep. You look at it right here. What is walking in the light or being a disciple? It's, it's walking in the light of the truth. Yeah. So when God's truth is revealed because you read it, someone told you it was preached mm-hmm. week in and week out at church, when I hear and I do, yeah. that's, that's walking in the light. Yep. When I hear and I don't, now I'm walking in darkness. Yeah. Ooh, I might have to write that down. That might make it into a sermon. When we hear God's truth, his word, and we do, mm-hmm. we're walking in the light. Right. And it's not going to be perfect. Right. But when I hear and I don't, and I'm, given, I'm not giving him my yes, yep. now I'm walking in dark. I'm yeah. stumbling, as Eugene said, I'm stumbling around in yeah. the dark. You know? Yeah, that's, that's great. And that comes directly out of that. It says, and yet we walk in darkness. We're lying and we're not practicing truth. And so I think that just that whole picture, it, it, it brings me back to James, where James talks about, you say that you have faith, but you have no works. And I say, show me your faith by your works and all that stuff. And it's a highly, um, at times, divisive um, text because people get their feelings hurt by the words of James because he shoots them straight. And, uh, and it becomes less of a gospel of consumption and a gospel of action. And I think that's, at the end of the day, what really steps on our American toes is when people tell us we need to do something with what we've been entrusted and given instead of simply just sitting on it and keeping it a secret. But, uh, but I think that that's just a beautiful picture of, of the process of following Jesus. I love that it uses words um, in here. Let me find it. Uh, Are you talking about in verse 8 or 7? Still, I'm in seven, seven now. Yeah, seven. Seven is about the um, the pros of walking in the light. Right. Yeah. But I, I that's that was that I found my thought now. Yeah. Go for but, it. But uh, but where it talks about like if we walk in the light as He Himself is light, we have shell, fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses us from all sin. And so I love there what I see as just a person reading Scripture is. And I'm my job isn't to do anything but just obey Jesus. And I th- like I think sometimes in Christianity in our faith we get so just like hung up on can I do more? Can I do enough? And it's like man, if I just say yes to Jesus, He's gonna do it. And and life gets really, really simple. Yes, and I think that 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 whole piece of um, becoming I, I mean I I'm somebody that it's been talked about and this is not meant in any other way. But I haven't been a Christian for very long. And, uh, but I've found myself in a lot of situations being able to speak into certain different things. And often the question that gets asked is, well, what did you do? How did you get here? How, how, what happened? It's like, I just said yes to Jesus every time he asked me to do something. And sometimes I said no, and that's not me gloating or saying I'm any better. No, I promise you, I've got plenty of years of, and I'm still screwing up all the time. But I think that too often we try to program out what following Jesus looks like in the lives of Christians. And so, from ages zero to seven, we're just going to try to get them maybe excited about the stories. And then from seven to 13, we'll really dig into this Jesus thing. Maybe they'll give their, maybe they'll get baptized or give their life to Christ. But then 13 to 18, we're just going to have to try to do anything we can to make them think church is cool. And not have sex. Yeah. And don't, whatever you do, don't touch each other. <laughs> yeah. Don't then, touch each other. And we hope that you think church is cool. And at yeah. 18, you know, we'll probably do the prodigal son thing where they're all going to leave, but we'll be ready to welcome them back. But we'll do the awkward at Thanksgiving. You've been going to church? And then <laughs> from- You've got this played well, out, man. It's, and then they get back from college and then they kind of do their thing. And it's like, well, you know, you got to let your kids do their thing. And then some point in their 30s, they'll have kids and they'll figure it out again because they'll want to raise their family the way that they were raised. And that's just the discipleship process of- um, evangelical Northern Michigan kid. And it's like, what if we, as parents, as pastors, as a church, as followers of Jesus, stopped trying to program out what following Jesus is and just took him at his word that he's going to show us what it looks like? That when we say yes to him, right, as a student ministry, what is our thing that we preach all the time? It probably drives Benji nuts. 90% of our sermons end with, how are you going to say yes to Jesus in this? Right. What is this going to look like for you? Right. Because at the end of the day, you've got to decide. And there's not a program. There's not a process. There's nothing that you can iron out more perfectly than God's word, God's command, his spirit teaching us through that. And yes, that's the whole thing. That's it. And I, I know I'm not, I promise I'm not monetizing the word yes. It's just, it's the simplest yeah. way 
for me to think of following Jesus is it's it's a it's a posture. It's not a program. It's a posture. It's a and that's a very Christian ghetto way. Man, no, 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 no. That's it's a- it's surrender. It's your. I I think that I think about like my wife Hope. We haven't been married for a long time, but we've been married for a minute. And there are times where let's pick a chore, do the dishes, or no, let's vacuum. I hate vacuum. Vacuum the house. There are times where I do it, and I don't do it well, but it gets done, and it's done, and it's like, okay, yeah, thanks. But then there have been a few times, right, where she's away in Grand Rapids or something, and she comes home, and, I mean, I got after it. I did the baseboards. I vacuumed. I got the dog hair. Baseboards. And then, you don't have kids, and you're doing baseboards. And base I just boards. locked Chief yeah. in his ch- crate because I'm like, you're not screwing this up for me, bro. You're just going <laughs> to eat, sleep, and live in there for the next three days. But you do the whole thing, and she comes home, and it's like, this is awesome. And there's the, I I don't know if that makes sense, but there's the posture of, man, I get to do this. I'm going to clean this house so she comes home to a clean house. I can do it willingly because I want to. Exactly. I want to give this chore my yes. Yep. But then then there are the moments where she's asked me 11 times and I finally do it and I do it with a bad attitude and I never plug the vacuum into a different outlet, which if you only plug the vacuum into one outlet, the house (laughs) will not be that clean. But I'm going to tell you right now, I've vacuumed by only plugging into Uh, one outlet. That's my confession tapes. Hope, hold That's it over my head if you corners, want. But yeah, I think that it's a posture thing, right? It's an excitement. I get to serve in this way. I get to say yes to this thing. Why? Because I love her. And I think sometimes I forget that vacuuming is a good way to love somebody. But I think sometimes we we get so interested in doing for Jesus that we stop being with him, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. And I think that that whole picture of walking, I found it. It took me a minute, but I got there. It's a picture of walking with Christ. And that's where we begin to experience the light. That's how we begin to be exposed to the light. Is he's not up there pointing his finger, telling us everything we need to do and while it's wrong. He's right here with us. And we're doing it together. And that's all a long rant to say one sentence. But No, that's good. Yeah. Because it's practical. Uh the 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 walking in the light is practical and tactical. In yeah. fact, there was a, a band from the Christian ghetto that sang a whole song about I want to be in the light as he is in the light. Uh and it's all about walking in the light. Um and, and, and if we go back to what he said in the first five verses, he says, our point is we want you to have fellowship with him. Mm. So walking in the light, the first pro, even though it's not listed explicitly in verse seven in the context, which is everything in the first five verses, John says, walk, he's saying, listen, I'm, what I'm about to tell you is so you can have fellowship with mm-hmm. God. So we have all these people that want to experience God. They want to get the tingle. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, you know, they reduce it all to, you know, I just don't feel them or I just yeah. don't hear them. So we always come back to, have you given them your yes? Yep. Are you walking in the light? Are, are you practically and daily living according to the truth that you're hearing? Yeah. Or are you just applying the truth that's easy to apply? Yep. You know, hey, don't kill anybody. Well, yep. that's easy. I guess I'm walking in the light. Yep. Yeah, but are you hating? Yeah. Because both are a part of it. Well, Foster says something about the Holy Spirit uh, quenching and... uh Quenching and grieving. Grieving the Holy Spirit, yeah. And so I think that those are things as well that interfere with that fellowship with God. Would you? Yes, but because it's Fight Club style, now we got to go find where that's at. Where's quenching the Holy Spirit? Because I don't have that one in my head. Well, we'll finish your thought. No, but I think like with what you're saying is you're hitting on that key piece. So many, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's that whole, that fellowship piece. It's one that it's personal, right? Like, John Vermilia, the pastor of the tabernacle, who was my pastor, cannot create, produce fellowship with God for me, Britain. It's, all, it's an individual base, basis, that fellowship with God. And so it doesn't matter how long you studied before your sermon it, and all of that stuff. Those are all good things. But I think as Christians, we have to also look at that this fellowship with God is a personal aspect to our faith, if that makes sense. If that's like, I don't Benji, what do you think? Whenever you hear fellowship, your dad's Googling. I need some help. <laughs> <laughs> you got some fellowship over there, Benji? I don't know. Just, I don't know, friendship. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Friendship. That's It's individual, though. It's a fr- Just because John is Benji's dad, and now I've seen Benji every now and then when they're together, that doesn't mean me and Benji are boys. That's why we go get burgers, right? It's to continue building that relationship outside of just, well, we have a mutual relationship. We both know John, right? Right, right. But I think how many people's relationship with Jesus is built out of that. Right. Right. I I sit here and this guy talks to him and then he talks to me about him. And it's like personal fellowship is a big piece to that walking in light as well. 
Right. And that's what, I don't know, you were riffing on, but that, yeah. you said. So, so quench, when the word quench is used in scripture, it's speaking of suppressing fire. Mm-hmm. I never thought about it like that. Suppressing fire. Which is light. Yes. Which is light. Uh, excellent. I, I didn't think about that. So in Ephesians 6, verse 16, it says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So when I, when I'm living in obedience, I'm exhibiting faith because I'm believing God's way is better than what my evil desires are. And so when believers put on the shield of faith as part of their armor of God, they're extinguishing the power of fiery darts from Satan. That's not kid stuff. That's, yeah. that was written to adults right. too. Um, so then, uh, we go on to say, uh, the Holy spirit is like a fire dwelling in each believer and that express, and he expresses himself in our actions and our attitudes. So, so that's the whole quenching part, which is actually a reference um, to First Thessalonians five nineteen, when it says, "Do not quench the spirit," and that context is all about obedience. And then in Ephesians chapter four, it says, "Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption." And when we grieve the Holy Spirit, that's when we live like pagans, lie, when we're angry, when we steal. And this is all in the context of Ephesians 4, by cursing, by being bitter, unforgiveness, sexual immorality. All those things are grieving the Holy Spirit. So you nailed it with, with we quench by not living according to the light. And as Benji said, that, that hurts our friendship with God. Yep. Now, again, going back to that literal thing, there's so many Christians that are like, well, I failed. I stumbled. Well, I was in darkness. Now I need to become a Christian again. No, he didn't say he wasn't your friend again. He didn't say you weren't his child again. You're not his son again. But you've done something to hurt that relationship. You've damaged that relationship. So, you know, in the friendship, I want my relationship with you to be positive. So I don't want to do things that are going to quench the fire of our friendship That didn't sound very manly, (laughs) but you know what I meant. I don't want to do anything that would grieve you. Right. And in fact, there's been more than one time in our friendship when I've called you or texted you or said, hey man, I didn't mean anything by that. Or if I hurt you, that wasn't my intention or we forgive me for saying that. And you've done the same thing with me. That's how you keep a friendship tight. Yeah. And, and so, so that's the first benefit to, to go back to verse seven. The first benefit is fellowship with him. Yeah. But then he says the second benefit is that we have fellowship with one another mm. and the blood of Jesus cleanses us. Yeah. And so back, back to Eugene, uh, because I, I'm on a Eugene kick, it feels like, but he says, uh, if we walk in the light, God himself being the light, we experience a shared life with one another. And then I love this, as the sacrifice blood of Jesus, God's son, purges us from all sin. Hmm. He points to the progression. It, and so, yes, we are forgiven once and for all, positionally, before God. So when you're saved, you're saved, you're saved. That's hmm. what the Bible teaches. Otherwise, the Bible contradicts itself. Yep. This is where we come up with this theology. So as we've repeated Ephesians chapter one, all the benefits of having your identity in Christ, those don't get taken away every time I get angry with one of my children um, for the wrong reasons, or I'm in sin, I'm angry towards my wife. Um, But Eugene says, as the blood is also cleansing me. So I'm cleansed positionally, but his blood continues to cleanse me as I grow as a disciple in Jesus Christ. And there's the church ghetto word, right? That we find that process of sanctification. Sanctification. It's a Bible word. Yeah. It's it's the becoming more and more being like Christ in that process. And I I just love that. I I love the study note that the CSB has here. It says, um, fellowship, the shared knowledge of God's light and love is one of life's deepest satisfactions. Oh, that's good. And I think that just that whole picture of um, and friendships and relationships and relationship with God is there's that whole aspect of that. It's a shared knowledge of God's light and love and the deep satisfaction that comes from that. And I think about my greatest friendships are all with people that are deeply loved and know who God is. And in that, we find satisfaction in our relationships because there's no 
everybody's coming from playing from the same place, if that right. makes sense. And yes. there's not like a, we need more, or we want more, or why aren't you giving this to me? Or why can't you be more of this to me? But it's all, you know, we're all deeply satisfied in, in, our, in our love for Christ. We understand the light and the love that comes from that. And through that, those friendships grow stronger, they grow deeper. And I think that that's a big piece too. We're using a word friendship, but that's a big piece of marriage as well. Yeah. I, I was um, thinking the exact same thing. Yeah. I think marriage is one of the best pictures of this. Yeah. Because you fall in love and you both say, I do, and you commit your life. You make a covenant before mm-hmm. God to one another. And then the hard part begins. I mean, the fun begins. Yeah. You're in a relationship with your best friend, hopefully. Yep. But then there's also Even this. Even they mock you. and uh, Come on, man. There, there is a video <laughs> out there. Hope became my hero this week where I saw a video of Hope doing her best Pastor Britton impersonation, and it is price. It it might be on social media. Yeah, I don't know. No, I haven't. I posted on my story, but it's gone now. But she was going to some party, and I was. I felt attacked. No, I, no, she I'm wasn't attacked, no, yeah. dude. Because because what that says is she watches your every move. Oh yeah. And so imitation that's yep. the highest form of flattery. That's, yeah, she, yeah. The only thing she didn't do that she said she wished was the five finger point down. Yes, at the five all finger. of it at once. For some reason, I do that. And she goes, and I didn't mess with my wedding ring enough. Yeah, like, yeah, all right, yeah, all right, yeah, all right. yeah. You don't yeah. have to point out all the shortcomings. Yeah, right. But, but no, sorry. Mar- marriage is that picture because the first thing marriage does, I think, is expose your selfishness. Mm-hmm. Both of your selfishness <laughs> to one another. So now you think you're in a marriage with God, a covenant relationship with God, and there's no selfishness in him. There's only light in him. Mm-hmm. Being in relationship with him continues to expose all the dark places yeah. in me. And the longer you walk with God, the more you realize, man, there's a lot of dark in me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. all the time. Yeah. But it also points to something else. The reason marriages don't work is when we stop living, the best word I can come up with it is open, mm. which is a foundation of intimacy, right? And so when it's like, yeah, I did that, I messed up, I need to keep a short account. Yeah. Would you please forgive me for that? Mm. that that's not who I want to be. I'm going to try to do better. Yeah. That's, I mean- there is no married person in the world that should be expecting perfection if, right out of the gate. Right. You know, it takes time to work on yeah. things. And heard, sorry. Go no, ahead. you're good. No, it takes time to work on things. I think you hit on it. I heard a guy uh, break down forgiveness in marriage, like raking your yard. As you see the leaves fall and you're like, oh man, I'll get to it. And then the next time you're like, you know what, man, I'll get, I'll get to it. And then by the time you finally get out there to rake it and you realize, man, there are way more leaves than I thought they were. And he goes, what if I would have just raked the first time? How much easier would this have been? How much less work would this have been if I would have just raked the yard the first time the leaves fell? See, that's going to start a fight in Michigan. Because yeah. there are some people that are like, nope, I'm not uh, touching those leaves till they're all down. And then down. it snows 15 inches on top of it. Oh, then yeah. it's a mess. <laughs> Get some. Then uh, it But I think it's a cool a picture of that whole thing of raking. But as well as with that marriage thing, it's something else I want to hit on before we move on. Because I think that this could speak to people that are... Wanting to be married, are married, or recently not married, whatever that might be. But that whole piece of that the knowledge of God's light and love is one of life's, life's deepest satisfactions. And I think some areas in which I see marriages struggle is when I, as an individual, put so much pressure on someone else to satisfy me. But I think that the successful, the Christ centered, marriages that we see that are like, man, they've been married how long and they still love each other like that? And I think whenever we look at those, if we think, what is the root of that satisfaction in this marriage? And it's the fact that both of them are deeply satisfied in Christ and they find satisfaction in him. And now both parties in that relationship get to operate freely in the sense that there's not all this pressure on them to be enough for someone else to satisfy Mm -hmm. someone else because that's not weight that anyone was meant to carry. But I think that whenever you can be in a relationship, and that's why I would push so hard to anybody listening to this that is seeking to be in a relationship, if the individual you want to love forever is not satisfied in Jesus before you get married, it probably won't happen in the marriage. Sure, there are cases where it's happened before, but I'm telling you right now, if you have the ability not to jump into that relationship with somebody that doesn't find complete satisfaction in Christ, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. Because you're digging yourself you're, a hole. You're asking for heartache. Yeah. And Pain I think and that, heartache. And I think that that's that whole piece with marriages as well. The successful ones are people that find satisfaction in Jesus first. But So verse 8, <clears throat> this one, uh, this is the flip side. So that's what walking in the light is. Uh, on the flip side, he 
presupposes what the resistance is going to be in people's hearts. When he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That's just black and white. Yeah. Now, um, a, a pastor friend of ours, uh, is, <laughs> he, he laughs at his own jokes, um, which is not a bad thing because I, I think, think I've hilarious. seen him do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but he loved to say all the time, how do you know if you're being deceived? And the answer is you don't. <laughs> you just don't. Yeah. And self-deception. I mean, we can be deceived by the enemy. We can be deceived by culture, by the world. Um, and there's a lot of that going out right now. Oh. But the biggest deception is self-deception. Yeah. And that's what he's speaking of here. It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. In the message, it says it this way. If we claim we're free from sin, we're only fooling ourselves. Hmm. A claim like that is errant nonsense. Yeah. So this whole idea of, of self-deception, the Bible says, um, Jeremiah 17, 9, 17, 9, this is the classic, uh, you know, I think I referenced this in a sermon just a couple weeks ago. You know, we say, hey, whatever you do, just follow your heart. <laughs> Yep. And the problem is the Bible, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, you got it right there? Yep. Read it for us, bro. The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? Who can understand? And, and the, it says that in more than one place. That's probably the yeah. most famous place. In the ESV, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I love that question. Yeah. Who can understand it? Who can understand it? This is why we need the word. Mm -hmm. So how do you know if you've been deceived and you're deceiving That's yourself? You need the word. Yeah. How do you know if you're being deceived? You don't. You need someone to preach the word to you. Yep. How do you know if you're being deceived? You don't. You need someone to teach you the word. How do you know if you're being deceived? You don't. You need podcasts where we're breaking down the Bible yeah. or whatever tool that you Fight need. Fight club table. Fight club table. Women's Bible partners, study. Foundry. Yeah. yeah. You need brothers and sisters to say, this is what the word says. Yep. Not that we want to be Bible quoting verses like, yeah. like magic fixes. I'm, right. I'm not talking about that. But the truth of walking in the light, we need to be with other people who are walking in the light. They're going to be real with us. Yes. And talk to, I mean, from a man perspective, like, dude, it would drive me insane if I had dudes like you and Adam and my buddy Trey that lives in Portland and different people like Ad Andrew Clark that are in my life that see different parts of my life that maybe are blind spots. I think that's a good word for this deceiving yourself, right? It's a blind spot. It's an area that maybe you don't know that you're struggling. But for them to be able to talk to me like a man, hey, bro, what is this? Figure that out, right? Adam had an incredible moment, um, and I don't have to go into depth with it, but one day there was a blind spot. And just in a car ride from a coffee shop back to this building, he exposed that blind spot. He talked to me like a man, and things have gotten a lot better in that space. And I think that that's the key piece, though, is I had somebody that was willing to just say and call it out. But everything he said was informed by Scripture, right. by God's Spirit speaking through right. him and through his own personal discipleship with and his own walking in the light as well. And I think that's a key piece too. But that was a question I was going to ask you, which you hit on it perfectly, was what are practical ways in which, because um, you said, if I'm being deceived, how do you know? You don't. So what are practical ways that I can continue to expose myself to truth with the hope that God's spirit would reveal to me the areas of my life that maybe there still are darkness or there still is uh, me, I'm being deceived by whatever that might be. And I think you hit on it. Yeah. Really. I I think the short answer to summarize it is you need to find a way to feed on the word. Yep. And that's, I don't care if that's ghetto or not. Mm -hmm. That's why people need church. Yep. You know, there's a lot of people that say, well, I can be a Christian and not be in church. Um, well, why would you want to? There are so many things I wouldn't preach to myself for the sake of comfort. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I would never talk about giving. Oh, if yeah. it was just me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have my old little church yeah. of one and I'm exactly. not going to talk about giving. That's right. an easy one. And I'm not going to talk about submission mm -hmm. and I'm not going to talk about obedience. Yep. I'm not going to talk about not cutting corners mm -hmm. in my obedience. Yeah. And so the point of being a part of a church is where God's word is exposed mm -hmm. to us and we're exposed to it. In fact, our favorite form of preaching at the tab and you and I as preachers, our fam favorite form of preaching is what we call expository preaching, yeah. where we're expositing or exposing yeah. the word. Yeah. That's what we're doing. And so it starts in church where someone's preaching and teaching God's word in context, yep. rightly, and the Holy Spirit's at work where the two or three are gathered, it starts there. And then all the things that we've mentioned, exposing myself in small groups and exposing myself to God's word, reading it on 
my own. Um, there's, there's, there's actually a cross-reference that I found off gotquestions.org, Great. which here's a fun fact. I'm in. I don't want to go too far down this bunny trail. I'm definitely old guy now. Yeah. I was doing some research and I'm using probably the best as far as I know, quick reference on every question you could ever have about the Bible. We've featured it before. Gotquestions.org. Not, question, not questions. Not questions.com. He got his ordinate, ordination through gotquestions.org. It's, it's got answers for it's it's got answers for questions I didn't ask. Yeah. Like I'll <laughs> dial something in and then there's uh, articles. It's like, oh, I didn't think about that question. Right. Well, f- just for some sermon prep, I looked up an article and there were two errors in the opening statement. And I sent godquestions.org a question. Mm. And essentially, it's like, I, I won't read the whole thing to you, but I'm not trying to be that guy. Right. But on this article, on this question, there were two errors right at the beginning. And I just pointed those out yeah. and then was quick to say, I love your, because 99.9% right. of what they share is right on. Mm-hmm. But this is my little nugget. And it had to do with communion. Hmm. It had to do with the Last Supper. And the only reason I know that is I preached on it last Easter yeah. or the Easter before um, where it said, uh, uh, you know, I think the question was, why did, you know, why did Jesus say this is my body broken for you? And the very first thing it says, all four gospels record that Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. And it meant his body and not his bones. And then it said something else. And then I was like, okay, f- hang on a minute. <laughs> first of all, all four gospels don't say that. John doesn't recount the Last Supper as far as the institution of the Lord's Supper. Mm-hmm. And the other three, two of them say, this is my body, take and eat. Mm-hmm. And Luke says, this is my body given for you. Nobody's None of them said, bro- pastors say, this is yes. my body broken for you. Mm-hmm. No, he broke bread. Yep. But, and then of course, the reason is, is because Jesus didn't break. Right. No bones were broken. Yep. You know, That's his body was killed. the only time I become killed. a little legalist is yeah. in Man of Stephen, we do communion and people are like, well, what do we say? Either don't say anything, but whatever you do, do don't. not say that it's Christ's body broken for you. No, it's not, because <laughs> Jesus didn't break. Yeah. I break, yep. you break, we break, yep. you know, and I maybe we're spiritualizing that yep. there, but I haven't got a response yet, but I'm hoping <laughs> they change that article, right. right? All of that to say, back to deception, mm-hmm. back to, because that is a deception yeah. from tradition. And, and it's, it's a little thing, but words matter. Yep. And if we're going to be people of the word capital W, hmm. then words, small w, they matter. Yeah. And so there's a cross-reference on deception from Obadiah. I don't think I've ever preached a message from Obadiah, but now I want to. In, the, in chapter three, Obadiah the prophet, he's talking Where to is. Israel. Oh yeah, it's way <laughs> deep in there. Uh, it's kind of towards the back. Two if you pages. went to Bible overview, you would know. <laughs> it's with the minor prophets. But in Obadiah three, um, which I believe uh, there's only one chapter in Obadiah. Yeah, that's why I can't find I'm not yeah. finding one page. It says, the pride of your heart has deceived you. Hmm. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? So most of our self-deception has to do with pride. Pride is the root of all sin, not money. Money is the root of all kinds of evil, but the root of all sin is pride. I know better. I deserve better. My way, not God's way. My stuff, not your stuff. Uh, What I want, not what you want. You can trace all sin back to pride. And right there, he says, the pride of our hearts is what has deceived them. So it's the pride of our hearts that deceives us. And I'm thinking, same thing with marriage. Hmm. All of my problems that, 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 my wife and I have ever had comes down to one of us is living from pride or both of us. And we're not, it's not that self-giving, self-sacrificing, um, selfless love that we promised that we would do, but we don't do perfectly. So when he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and that's pride and the truth is not in us. And so for Christians, we got to be careful, you know, of, of believing that we've arrived, mm. we've got to be careful of becoming a stagnant Christian. What's a stagnant Christian? Uh, you know what? I've progressed far enough. Yep. What else can I possibly need? What else can I possibly learn? What else is there? 
No, that's the self deception of pride yep. has completely kicked in. That's what uh, this actually this ties perfectly with a study note that the CSB has in both scripture and church history. People have excused their wrongful deeds by claiming to be right with God. John diagnosed an ancient and reoccurrent human tendency. Mm. And I think that that's that whole piece of pride, right? I'm good, right? I'm right with God. It's all good. We got this thing figured out, right? Me and Jesus, you know, we're homeboys, whatever that might be. But I think that that's that whole piece is there's that whole pride that you've, con- and, and at times you've convinced yourself of the lie, right? That I'm good. I'm good. And it's not, I don't know. This is such a splitting hairs thing because of what we just hit on and the fact of once saved, always saved, Jesus right. Christ cleanses us all. But I think my thing that I've come to often with students and with my leaders that Adam and I get the opportunities to, to, to be a part of their process of continuing to chase after Jesus and serve him is that whole piece of like, why do we have to do that? Hmm. Well, do you love Jesus? Yeah, of course I love Jesus. Do you want to follow Jesus? Yeah. Why don't you want to? Right, and I think that that's that whole piece with that deceit. Like, if you're coming to church and you're bought in, you're doing this thing. There's that at the end of the day. That's the word, though, that it boils down to is it's pride or laziness, which ultimately. Right. But I right. think that's that whole piece that I'm good. Why so, not? So there's a great example of this from the Old Testament when we went through our judges series. We talked about Samson, mm-hmm. and Samson from the time he was in his mother's womb, he was chosen by God. So if there's any guy that could pull off the once saved, always saved, I'm chosen by God, you know, (laughs) never touch dead things. And I got, you know, never cut my hair, never drink, you know, all the Nazarite vow stuff that he had to keep. And he had this unbelievable strength and God's using him to deliver Israel from everything. But self-deception that came from pride, Mm -hmm. right? Because no, dude, you're undefeated. Your whole life, you're undefeated. Yeah. I mean, you're killing lions, you know, and then you're eating honey out of them. You know, you're killing 700 with a donkey jawbone or whatever those numbers were. I mean, they're just epic in the book of Judges. But when you follow his story, and here's here's one other thing about Judges. Samson gets more press in Judges than just about any other judge. And there's some great ones. There's some righteous ones. Mm -hmm. But this conflicted guy that becomes pride-filled, complacent, begins to deceive himself. He's not to be with the Moabite women, right? Well, the problem is there's one that just, you know, he's starting thinking he's bulletproof and I've arrived, you know, all of the things mm-hmm. that the modern Christian could have. And he's in love with Delilah and he's, you know, playing flirty, flirty, teasy mm-hmm. games with her. And she's like, you don't love me. If you love me, you tell me the secret of your strength. And it's like, how many courting relationships yeah. have, have you heard that? It's like, man, I don't think that girl's good for you because uh, she's not really saved or, mm-hmm. or that guy's not good for you. And it's like, yeah, but she's so beautiful and yep. she gets me and we're just kind of, you know, magic. And we don't know what level of depravity that they were living in right. until finally his pride and self-deception left him or led him so far. He disclosed to her the secret of his strength. And in his sleep, she betrayed him, cut his hair off. And he's taken captive and his life doesn't end well. Yeah. It doesn't. And that's where this self-deception, he started out walking in the light, mm-hmm. fulfilling that Old Testament Nazarite vow, doing yep. what God had him or, or had for him to do his purpose and plan. But then when self-deception pride, he's, then he starts walking in darkness and he finds himself, interestingly enough, and I didn't think about this till just now. If you know the story from Judges of Samson, I encourage if you don't know it, I encourage you to go read it. He found himself in the dark, mm. in a dungeon. They gouged out his eyeballs. He's blind, and he's grinding the grain of their idols. He starts out in the light, and he finds himself grinding grain for a false god in the dark. And we don't know how many years he was in that dungeon before they, you know, his hair starts to grow. And, 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 and there's the good news is God's not done with Samson, just yeah. like God's not done with us. Yeah. The very next verse, in verse nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah. I have probably written that verse on more pieces of paper or that, at least that Bible reference than mm-hmm. any other reference. Yeah. You know, all through my days playing for the Charlotte Eagles, you know, kids had come up and, hey, we want autographs. And, you know, of course, they wanted autographs of all the stars right. of the pro team. But then when they got down to the sub, 
Oh, there's no line over there. Johnny yeah. V. Yeah, there's no <laughs> line right over there for that Johnny V utility player guy. Uh, I would put my John Hancock, put, you know, hashtag, you know, yeah. number 18. That was my number. And then I'd always put first John one nine. Mm-hmm. One John nine. Yeah. Or one John one nine is yeah. what I would always put put down because that's a promise. Yeah. And that was a promise that was good for Samson when finally, you know, they drag him out. Uh just to go back to that story, they drag him out and they're having a big party and, and they um you know, he's blind and they're mocking him and his God, and he breathes a final prayer. Lord, just one more time. And and I, I, I think in that moment he'd come to the end of him his pride and his yeah. self deception and they put his hand on either pillar and you know, in his death, there was a great victory uh, for God, but it cost him his life, yeah. cost him everything, cost him his eyes, mm. L- living in the, I don't want to, I don't want to end that way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah. there's good news is that we can be cleansed. Right. If we were at a fight club table, I would ask this question. So whenever it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So like confession, some people um, come from backgrounds where confession is something that happens in a booth with um, a holier person than me sitting there next to me. What is what does that process of confession look like for us today um, as people trying to follow Jesus? Yeah. For me, I would take it back to friendship, the friendship between you and me. Mm-hmm. Uh, we became friends. Um, I, I think we became friends initially. Um, Outside of Denver, Colorado, Winter Park. Yep. I we had met before. Yeah. And our very first meeting, um, I made you angry. <laughs> uh, but I didn't know you. Yeah. And I hadn't met you. And um and you were the bigger person because then later I was a teacher at yep. a discipleship thing that you were at. And we probably, hey, what's up there? But I don't even know if we connected right. that we were at the same place before. But then it was at Winter Park at a camp and we were skipping a session. <laughs> And we were talking duck hunting yeah. and Oklahoma and redneck stuff yep. and Jocko podcast mm-hmm. and telling, you know, coaxing jokes. Yeah. And, and then it became, oh man, I don't know. I want to sit in this seminar. And then I'd be out in the lobby and there was Britain again, because <laughs> you don't want to sit in one e- either. We just had a blast. Right. So that's where it began. Yeah. But it's grown deeper um, since you've moved to Michigan, mm-hmm. part of our team. And, um, and so when it says... Like, like, like there was initial friendship that began, but what I alluded to before where I have misspoken or where I forgot you Mm -hmm. or I overlooked you in some way or overlooked maybe a sensitive spot, you towards me or, and we've kept short accounts. So when it says he cleanses us from all unrighteousness, my note here says that when we initially receive salvation, that's when we confess our sins to God. Mm-hmm. When we say, God, I want you in my life. Forgive me of my sin. You know, for me, that's happened a thousand times before I finally right. started to read my Bible and hey, figure I grew it up out. Baptist, bro. We did it every Sunday. <laughs> God saved again, man. <laughs> right. But that happens once. That's when the yeah. friendship begins. Um, because God, it says here, um, God is faithful and just. And it, and it references Numbers 14, verse 18 which says that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But then he goes on to say that this persistent unrepentant sin is not the mark of a Christian Yeah. because God will by no means. So if I said, Hey, let's be friends. And then I continued to offend you. Mm-hmm. Or if I said, Hey, let's be friends. And then I treat you like I don't even know you right. or we never hang out. We don't break bread together. We don't, um, we don't talk about, you know, what you like right. and you talk about what I like, mm. you know, like I'll get into college football a little bit more when Britain's around. Right. You know, you'll yeah. humble yourself to watch World Cup soccer game. Yeah, hey, I watch the whole thing. My yeah. favorite whole, whole entire favorite quote, this guy goes live on Instagram and he goes three hours ago, uh, the U S and the Wales were set to play in a World Cup match. It's now been three hours. Nothing changed. <laughs> <laughs> the results are the same. It's because the, yeah. they drew one one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but just but that's that kind of meeting in mm-hmm. you know together. It's so when kit. it says it's not a jersey, it's a kit. Those it's are a the kit. things you learn. Right? Yeah, yeah, they're not cleats. They're boots. Exactly. Yeah, it's not a field. It's a pitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not an end line. It's into touch. Exactly. <laughs> right. And you just play the feet. You, you just play the feet. So back to your question. There is that initial forgiveness. Right. 
but I think there's this ongoing, not that I have to earn anything mm-hmm. from you, but because I love you, I believe you love me. We don't want anything between us. Right. And so that's why it's like when I do sin and as a pastor, I still do. Yeah. You know, if I sin against a person, I ask their forgiveness and I ask God yeah. to forgive as mm-hmm. well, you know. So in that conf- I think that's what it means. Yeah. And in confession, do you think that that is something that, I mean, and I think I know your answer, but is that something that just happens between me and God? Is that something that I need to invite other people into? Oh, I think both. Yeah. Both. Now, I'm not going to, now this is the foundation or the question that you're asking is the foundation for why some churches, namely the Roman Catholic Church, yep. demands that people confess their sins to a priest. Yep. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we have to confess our sins to a priest or it doesn't count, Mm -hmm. that some priest is going to come in and give you absolution. Right. Bible is very clear. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Yeah. But I think that where, where, where you're kind of going is James. Yeah. Right. Um, is that, uh, uh, James chapter two, if we confess our sins or no, confess our sins one to another. Uh, There's silence on this podcast. What yeah, are I know it's in Google? James. Yeah. Let's see if I can read Google. Here, Mark, you take This is why it's not a bad thing to have that phone. James 5. Beat you. I should know that by heart. Oh, wow. We must not be very good pastors. It's okay, dude. I had to go to the table of uh, context earlier to find Obadiah, which is on page 819. I'll never forget that. <laughs> it says right here um, uh, in, in James in James 5, 16. this is actually in the context of prayer. Yep. And it's talking about actually uh, if, if anyone's sick, they should call the elders of the church to lay hands on them and pray them and anoint them with oil. Um, and it says the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. It doesn't mean that we have the power to heal people. It means that the prayer of faith will either heal you in this life or in the next. The Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Verse 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. There's more than one place that tells us that we should confess our sins to one another, but that's the most prominent one. Yeah. Um, and I think that's specifically if I've sinned against you mm-hmm. or it isn't always if I've sinned against right. you. I mean, there's times when there's sin. It, it, in fact, I had a mentor one time confess sin to me and I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> like yeah. he, he, he just was like, Hey, you know, Hey, I, you know, we're at a thing together. I probably told you the story one time. We're at a thing. I won't give you the details or even who it was, but, um, uh, he said, Hey, I, I did this and, um, nobody knows about it. And, I was wrong and yeah, I just needed to tell somebody that's all. Yeah. And it it, it wasn't, you know, gross. Nobody died. Nobody had an affair or anything like that. And he didn't steal anything, but it was, it was sin in his heart and he, and he'd already talked to God about it, but he wanted me to know about it. And he rolled over and he went to bed. We were, we were at a conference. We were sharing a hotel room and I was just sitting there going, that just happened. Yeah. And I'm like, I didn't think that guy ever sinned. Right. Oh, and then I asked him years later, I was like, hey, do you remember that time we we're at that conference and you confessed that thing? And he barely remembered it. And he goes, if you said I did it, then I did. And I was like, man, you were teaching me something, weren't you? And he goes, oh yeah, it's a good thing to, you know, once, once the darkness, mm-hmm. in fact, he's, I'm paraphrasing now, because yep. I didn't realize at the time that how impactful it was and I'm going to use it. Once that darkness comes out and it's exposed to the light, it loses its power on me. Mm. And so it was good for me. And I'm like, well, I don't know if you meant it to teach me something, but that's taught me something. Mm. And I've tried to do the same practice. Yeah. Hey, this was a bad thing. And I had this attitude in my heart and I didn't need to tell anybody, mm-hmm. but I've tried to tell other pastors on our staff yep. or people that are in my life that I trust, Hey, this was wrong. Yeah. And I kind of went there Yep. and, uh, I've asked God to forgive me, but back to the light and darkness thing, light cancels out darkness. When we take that, this is the truth of who I am. And I put it out there for God and my brothers, people I can trust or God and my wife, Mm -hmm. Darcy, Darcy knows. But then when I say it, you know, not being caught, 
Right. But when I say it, this happened, I did this, I, this was my attitude, I was wrong there, I, I, I let work impact the way I spoke to you, yep. I need you to forgive me. She already knew, hmm. but I needed to put it out there. Um, and, and then you just watch the light yeah. chase the darkness. Away. Yeah. I don't know if that helps. But. No, it does for sure. And that's, I think, a good encouragement for the importance of uh, surrounding yourselves. And, and that's that whole thing of why you have church and why you belong to a body of believers is because there's a, there's a sharing of burdens, I think, at times. And that's not just um, needs, right? There are times in my life, whatever that might be, um, where I just need some brothers to come alongside me and, uh, and fight with me, fight for me, or at times fight against me. And uh, in those moments, I think it's easy for myself to justify sin, but when I bring it to light and I give it to somebody else and I can hear um, their perspective or them be able to speak into that, it becomes a lot. Uh, yeah, it just it, it continues that process of becoming like Christ. So, And then verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So, yeah, my study note for that. Since God is light and there is no darkness in him, verse 5, to claim to be without sin is to claim to be on par with God. But God says there is no one like him. If his word is not in us, the saving message of Christ has not taken root. There may be surface knowledge of Christian religion, but the heart has not been transformed. Yeah, and you know, I'm reminded of um, Paul. Paul says in Romans, how can they know unless, Romans five, yeah. yeah, Romans 5, how can they know unless they have heard and how can they, or no, how can they believe unless they have heard and how can they hear unless someone tells them? It, it plays right back in to the, how do you know if you've been deceived? You don't. You need somebody to tell you. You need someone to preach, proclaim, teach, sing. Because it can come through a song, demonstrate the word. And so um, there are hearts that are soft already to God's truth. First John, or no, what is it? Uh, John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless my father draws him first. The truth can go out and people's hearts are not convicted. But when God is drawing someone to themselves and the Holy Spirit is working in someone's life, truth becomes like a spark to gasoline. Or I probably would flip that metaphor. Truth becomes the gasoline on the fire that the Holy Spirit is ignited. The Holy Spirit is drawing that person. And when that gas hits that fire, boom, you have an explosion. And there's light and there's heat and... um. You know, I've seen it before. Maybe you experienced it in your own life where, yeah, you heard the truth and you were like, yeah, Jesus died for my sins, but I don't think I'm that bad. Right. Well, you're lying to yourself and you're mm-hmm. lying to other people. The truth is not in you. Yeah. Um, but when his word begins to draw us, when the word, capital W, the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, um, the one that where John said, in the beginning was the word and the word was God, or the word was with God and the word was God. It was by him and through mm-hmm. him all things were made. Jesus is the word. So when the word starts drawing and we hear the truth about his perfection and our sinfulness, that's when conviction sets in. Mm. And it's like, oh, and there's a lot of people that call themselves Christians and they've never mourned or grieved their sin. Yeah. I think that was the, you know, I think that was the biggest shift in my own personal uh, relationship with Christ. We've covered that a little bit, but there were definitely those moments of, yeah, yeah, I believe in this Jesus guy. That's a thing. Right. But it's the, what we call in Oklahoma the good old boy syndrome, right? I'm a good person. I take care of people. Um, I'll meet some needs if needed. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a good guy. Good. I'm a good dude. But it wasn't until when I was in college that, that, that moment where I realized, like, man, like, no, this is real. And I think that's that whole piece of what you were just talking about, that the word of Christ, the truth of him uh, infiltrated my innermost being. And I think even in your story, uh, your testimony, you had a moment like that as well where it was, more than just I go to church, I do the thing, but there was this moment, right? And I think that, yeah, that was Romans 10, not Romans 5. Romans, oh. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, so that's First John. There, there, There's one other little warning for, for us. Uh, I found a cross-reference to later in this same book. Yep. First John chapter 3, um, 
in first John three, uh, starting in verse four. So this is in his same, because this whole, I mean, the book of first John is, is worth a fight club or women's Bible study, foundry study all in itself. And I, I don't think necessarily we're going to go all through first John on this podcast, but we could, because he's going to go back to this when you get to chapter three. So in three verse four, he says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practice lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins and in him, there's no sin. He's repeating chapter one. Verse six, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. And then he says again, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was destroyed the works of the devil. So that begs a question. If you just start stopped with verse 6 and it says, oh, it looks like he's pointing to sinless perfection. Because in verse 6 it says, whoever keeps on sinning obviously isn't a Christian. Yeah. No, because he explains it in the very next verse. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. What it's saying there is if I'm okay with my sin and I'm just going to keep on sinning, you need to be really, really careful. Yeah. But if I'm not okay with my sin, I might stumble and fall and stumble and fall, but I'm, I'm doing my, I'm giving God my yes and I'm trying to practice righteousness. Yep. So it's which way is my body aimed? Mm-hmm. Which way is my heart aimed? Which way is my mind aimed? And it's, and no matter how many, like, I would love the Tab family to hear encouragement today and not, I'm not there yet. So I must, you know, I, I must not be saved. Hey, listen, if you're not saved, ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. If you're in sin and you know you're saved, ask Christ to forgive you of the sin that you're in sin, Mm -hmm. because he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. But the direction and the angle of our hearts is about walking in the light. Mm -hmm. And if you feel like you're in the darkness, walk towards the light until you get in that room where there's more lights than in the room that you're in. You got to keep moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. The sun is coming up, walk towards the sun, walk towards that light. And uh, the light chases out all the darkness in me and in you and in us. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's that whole thing. And I think that's the encouragement that this is a process and that we're people of process. This is... um, the arrival point in our faith or in our discipleship journey, whatever that might be, um, isn't going to happen on this side of eternity. And we will continuously um, be people that are being shaped and formed into the likeness of Christ. And that comes from um, being real with yourself, being real with one another, and uh, obeying Christ uh, at his commands. And I think that we hit on that well. And so I think for us as a church to be people of light, um, it starts with simply one, saying yes to Jesus, figuring out what he has to say about life on his terms, and then just doing our best. Yeah. Uh, it's that whole adage, right? It's a long obedience in the same direction. Well, there's, there's an authenticity to it mm-hmm. as well. And so when he said there at the end of that passage, if we claim we have no sin, we make him out to be a liar. Mm-hmm. And so people that are not just naturally, and maybe this is a 2022 cultural right. thing, is when, when I hear a speaker or a pastor, preacher, anyone breaking down God's word. If they're always the hero mm-hmm. of every one of their stories, if I never hear where they fall, where they fail, where they screw up, where they're weak, I tend to not believe them. Right. And so that, that idea of authenticity, just yeah. from a listener, I'm mm-hmm. like, eh, this guy, there's something too good to be right. true. Right. Um, but when someone is authentic, genuinely authentic. Right. I don't know how, yeah. <laughs> I mean, how do, how do you get more authentic than a, right. genuinely authentic? But I think we're called to be that way with one another. Yeah. One thing that we want people to feel at our church, and we don't do it perfectly, mm-hmm. that it's okay to be who you are. Yep. It's okay to struggle. Yeah. That doesn't mean we're okay with sin. Yep. That means that if if our shortcomings and our failures, if we can put them out there, again, take it out of the darkness of my heart and my secret, and I can bring it into the light, now we can deal with it. Yeah. Now you said it, I so, heard it, and now, you know, and, and God already yeah. knows before both of us do, yep. 
before I got over my self-deception and I'm done hiding it from you. Now we can deal with it rather than we don't want to be a church where we wear masks, where we try to, you know, how you doing today? I'm fine. Mm-hmm. You, you, you know, and sometimes you are fine, but lots of times there's a struggle and there's anxiety, there's fear, there's shame, there's hurt. There's this thing that I don't want to let go of. I don't want to forgive. Mm-hmm. And I think what he's calling us to is this open authenticity. Yep. That's a big part of walking in the light. It's yeah. not being perfect. Right. It's look, light expose me for who I am. Yeah. What did our first parents do? They hid. Yep. And they covered themselves. They tried to get in the shadows and, and, and they covered because they were full of shame. And shame is a powerful, powerful slave master. And there's so many people, uh, I have lived in shame. Mm-hmm. And, and, and until sin is exposed, and it's better when you do the exposing, right. shame loses its power. Yeah. Pastor Tim's a great example of this. Mm-hmm. He, he doesn't do it as often um, as, as he used to do it, but probably his first two years um, at the tab preaching, um, you know, we'd always say, you know, hi, I'm John. I'm one of the pastors or hi, you know, when Chris yep. was here, hi, I'm Chris. I'm one of the pastors here. You know, we'd give our title. We'd just say, right. hey, I'm one of the pastors. Tim would get up and say, hi, I'm Tim and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and I'm also a pastor here. Yeah. And, you know, as I thought about that, you know, it was a great move right. because um, there's a lot of people that were like, well, he's an alcoholic. Right. Even though, you know, he's been sober at that time. He'd been sober almost 20 years. Now it's yeah. been over 32 years, I think, you know, but, but by saying it, he's living in the light of his worst shame. Yep. That something tried to master me mm-hmm. by God's grace. I'm living soberly. Yeah. And so when he would say, hi, I'm Tim, I'm an alcoholic. What are you going to do? Call him the town drunk? Right. He already led with that. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing left. Now, there are some people, and dude, we just got to say this. There are some people I know for a fact in our church that they still struggle with that. Mm -hmm. And I would guess it's because they can't deal with their own stuff. Yep. And and someone that lives that authentically before God and man Mm -hmm. scares them. Yeah. I hope it scares the hell out of them. Because that's, that's hell that mm-hmm. has a grip on their heart that says, I got to keep everything secret yep. and I got, I got to put on a facade and I got to look a certain way. Mm-hmm. And Tim just comes in there and blows it up. Yep. You know, to me, that's a great example of how I we're all supposed to live. Yeah. I love that. I'm reading a book right now uh, called Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. And one of the points in it is he talks about pray as you are. If you can't pray, pray ho- uh, prayers of hope and, uh, and dreams, pray prayers of hopelessness. But pray as you are. Don't let the fact that you can't stop you from doing it. And I think that's a whole picture of, of uh, like what you're talking about is there's so many of us that we start to fall into that line of shame and that I can't be this and I can't do that. And I can't be exposed to light. And I think so often we think that God's scared of that. But I think and that allows us to drive ourselves further and further and further. And then we end up in that moment. Man, how the heck did I get here? And so that would be that's a good piece of encouragement is don't don't allow the lies, the the shame, the dissatisfaction with yourself to then permeate how you think God feels about you. Cause at the end of the day, that's just not who he is. That doesn't line up with his character. So, well, sweet. Um, that was fun. It was, it was good. It was fun. It's always fun. Great studying time. The Bible with Absolutely. You. Benj, thanks for being here, bro. How you doing? I told you about my five guys experience. Didn't I where I accidentally got a triple and I told hope, I just said, Benji would be proud. Because I didn't realize, for some reason, I didn't realize that their normal burger comes with two patties. Yeah. And so obviously I got the extra patty and I'm like, oh crap. There's three. So I got a triple with bacon, cheese, A1 sauce, mushrooms. Praise God, Benji. It was so good. Five I've watched guys. him devour a triple quicker than I could get through. I was, I've been there. I've half seen it. of a regular and some fries on the it's side. It's like, it's like animal planet type, like just getting that's like a downed gazelle. I gotta eat this for the when rest I got of the pr- over halfway through a regular burger, I start getting the meat sweats. Yes, and Benji's over there wiping his mouth like, "What's next?" Did it you this know? week? It, we're, we went to Whispers the other day, bro. Smashes burger. I look up. I'm like, "What the heck?" No, he that? inhales it. He <laughs> Love breathes it. burgers Love in. It. In my yeah. Forge bio, whenever you go places and they read it, I put in there self-proclaimed burger connoisseur. And Hope was like, "Why? Do you, that's so stupid. Why would you put that in there?" Oh, that's and I a said, beautiful thing. Hope it's strategic because now anywhere I go. Anytime I go, 
They take me to the best burger place they have in town. You're not walking in darkness. You're no. walking in light. Yeah, they want to prove to me that they have the best burger. Hey, shout out to the squad in Knoxville, Tennessee, because I'm going to tell you right now, Mike and Jill Owens, that's the best burger I've had on the road. I know you guys listen to the For podcast. So. Was that at their home or was that a place? No, it was a place downtown. I can't remember what it was in Knoxville. I went out and saw old J. Rowe, but he had obviously he had other people host me yeah, because yeah, they're yeah. the most incredible people ever. The Owens family, and they took me for the best burger I've ever had. Legit. Okay, so you just okay, so that's a bu- people always ask ask me what's on your bucket list? Yeah, uh, things that aren't attainable. Yep, right. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it, not stuff. Yeah, but like to do, I would do best burger in all fifty states. Oh, that'd be fun. Would that? And you would a- just go to Five Guys in all fifty <laughs> states. <laughs> Love it. Sweet. Well, podcast family, with that being said, I'm hungry. So it's John, Benji, and Britton signing off. Mm-hmm.